uh, on Node on Bolt, it allows you to create like a node-based graphs that's useful for uh, you know non-programmers. But it's also useful for coders if you have experience making games inside Unity. Bolt is also still useful for you, and you can leverage the power of uh, its flexibility and its uh, ability to build state state graphs to uh, kind of extend your workflow. Uh, it also includes a really powerful API for advanced tasks and custom nodes that you can build using your existing c -sharp code. So whatever you have built before, you can convert those into bolt nodes that you can allow artists or your designers to go in and tinker further uh, in a more friendlier, user-friendly way. So here are some uh, useful example use cases uh, for Bolt. For maybe a game jam scenario, you can actually use it for rapidly prototyping your interactive systems. Or if you're an artist and you want to build uh, simple interactive uh, models or dioramas in your, in your showcase, you can use this to uh, invoke animations uh, really simply uh, using Bolt. It's also a great learning tool for learning how to work with C Sharp because it's still object oriented. Um, all the tools that you would normally find in, within Unity and C Sharp, it's still it's available in Bolt. Um, and as I mentioned before, you can make regular scripts uh, accessible for non programmers. So, um, for all of you coders out there, this is still a useful tool for you to help extend your uh, entire pipeline. Um, you can also develop templates and tools that you can use to share with other Unity users. For example, you could leverage the, the power of, of state on flow and flow graph to create perhaps your own dialogue system uh, and package that as a tool and reuse it in a future project or give it to another Unity user. Um, and any uh, project shipping with uh, Unity 2018 can leverage this, uh, this, this plugin. So how do you get both? Uh, Bolt is completely free. It's served from the Unity Asset Store. You can download it and acquire it there. Once you have it, you can just import straight from the Asset Store. Or if you're on Unity 20.1, 20, 20 uh, you'll have to import it through the Package Manager. And once you've done that, uh, a friendly Bolt setup wizard will pop up and uh, walk you through the steps of um, initializing your project for Bolt and then you're ready for visual scripting. So today I'm gonna walk you through a live and simple demo about setting up a Bolt project and we're gonna create a really simple game. Um, we'll show you how to navigate Bolt's UI if you're not familiar with it. I'll also explain some core mechanics about graphs, machines, macros, and more. Uh, that's core to how Bolt works. We'll also create some basic interactions uh, with a lot of uh, trigger, trigger collisions. And at the end of this, I will pass uh, some examples and additional resources for you to continue on your journey to explore Bolt. So without wasting any more time, let's dive back in. So let me just exit here, switch over to my scene. So this is uh, Unity. Once you've imported your uh, Bolt, you'll actually be greeted by this friendly setup wizard over here like you saw in my slides earlier. Now from here, we'll just hit next. And if you're brand new to making games or brand new to coding uh, or programming, you might want to choose uh, human naming. If you're a programmer, uh, you might be more you might be more comfortable with how you know things look in C Sharp. You, you can pick and stay with programming naming. So we, we give you these options. So as a beginner, we'll probably just click on uh, human naming and uh, because of how Bolt is built, it's built to be quite flexible and as lightweight as possible. In here in the R assembly options, uh, we've only included uh, things that are core and crucial to uh, things that are commonly used when making games. If there are additional packages that you've purchased or imported from the package manager, you can actually add them in here. Or if you have custom scripts that you've built yourself, you can also add them in here. So. One of such example is the text mesh pro, which is served from the package manager. So this one, you would actually have to uh, import it in yourself. So you just click on the drop down, search for text mesh pro, add it in, and then hit next. And then there are some additional types here that uh, you also have to add in, like things like player prefs. 
uh, are not added in by default. So if you want to add that, and uh, if table preps is something you want to use, you can add this in. If it's not something you want to, if you won't be using, uh, you can leave that out, and that would you know help your compile be it's just a little bit faster. So I'm not going to hit generate because this is going to invoke a, a really long process of well, not too long, but you know we don't want to waste time just having it generate a new project. So I've already gone ahead and done this, and this is basically the project with human naming set on. And with both, it comes with a couple of uh, windows that, uh, new windows that you, you'll need to use and familiarize with to take advantage of uh, you know, this tool. So under the window drop-down menu, there are three new windows here. In the graph, graph inspector, and variables. So just go ahead and click and open those and arrange them in a way that makes sense. For me, uh, the graph here is actually the meat of the, the plugin where you will actually be forming and connecting nodes. So you need a lot of space for this. So I'm gonna dock it at the bottom. And for the other two, um, for the other two panels, these are inspector graphs uh, where you would, you would view contextually the nodes that you are selecting. Uh, on, on the on the graphs uh, panel itself. So usually I dock this on the left side together with your inspector. I've actually already gone ahead and saved uh, a setup here called Bolt. So I'm just gonna invoke my layout. Okay, and this is it. This is my, my setup, right? So I have a graph here. It takes up most of my space, my variables along the same column with my inspector, and then I also have a graph inspector, right? So all inspectors in one column, a graph, and my game view. So this is a relatively simple game. If I play it, you'll see nothing happens, except Penny here, our character, Penny Pixel, is running statically uh, in, in one spot. We have clouds moving, but there's nothing else going on here. If I go to the scene view, and zoom out a bit, you see that I have this obstacle here, and uh, the idea is that this is sort of a flappy bird game where the obstacle would move from the right to the left, collide with penny pixel. So to add a behavior or add any behavior to an obstacle, it's the same as you would do with a, with a script. Right, you attach a component to it. So if you look at this in the inspector, you see that it has nothing but some rigid bodies, some colliders, uh, and a tag to tell it you know, to to uh, collide with uh, Penny. Uh, but we have to add a behavior for it to move and also detect that collision. So we'll go here and add a component, and uh, we'll just look for machine. And in Bolt, you have two machines that you can use. One is flow and one is state. So flow is the, is the one you want to use for, for this case where we can string together uh, sets of logic to define a behavior. We'll talk about state machine in a moment um, towards the end of the, this demo. But for now, let's take a look at flow machine and understand that first. So I'll expand my flow machine. You can see here, I can set between uh, two different sources, either embed or macro. Uh, for macro, it will actually create a new asset that allow you to uh, save it into your project. So it becomes an asset that you can actually reuse later on on a different character. So this would be useful for our obstacle, for example, because we might have multiple different obstacles uh, in the future. So this is something we may want to uh, pull out and put it on a put on another uh, you know, object. If it's if it's a logic. A logical flow that only happens on this particular object, then you can choose embed, and that would not uh, have any, uh, would not generate any assets whatsoever. But because this is an obstacle, and we are going to reuse this, so let's just keep this as macro. Okay, and I'm just create a brand new object, uh, drop it into here, we call this obstacle. So it's a new macro for obstacles. And here we go. So now that we have some events here, start and update, uh, we can begin 
creating our flow graph. So this might be familiar to all you programmers. Uh, start, we have a start and update event, which you normally see in your template scripts. Start is, um, start is an event that will pulse the first time the script is initialized, whereas update is going to tick uh, for every frame of the second. All right, so we're gonna be working on update for this. Uh, we don't need start, so you can actually just freely delete this, right? So an update, what we're gonna do is move our obstacle from right to left. And an easy way to do that is actually to use the rigid body. You can also use the transform, but for this case, uh, it's much easier to just use our rigid body 2D. So let's say, uh, if you look for rigid body, for example, if I drag this uh, line out, we're trying to connect it to another node, right? And you can see that it will invoke this uh, search bar. And this gives you a fuzzy search bar that allows you to really, really nicely and quite powerfully look for components that uh, you want in, the, in all of Unity. So let's look for rigid body, for example. Let's say uh, we know that the category is gonna be rigid body 2D. You can see that there's a little arrow here that shows you this goes in deeper. And right in here is basically all the methods that you can use and invoke uh, for a rigid body object, for a rigid body script. So here we want to set a velocity. And actually, if I drag this a bit higher, I just want to show you guys the uh, description on the, on the method itself. Go to body 2D, set velocity. You can see below it says linear velocity of the rigid body in units per second. So it also tells you what are the uh, inputs that's expected. Uh, so, whatever uh, different variations of the same method uh, you want to look for, it's shown here clearly for you and you can access them uh, in bolt. So, it, it's a really good place to, it's a really good tool for you to learn how to use Unity as well. All the APIs are well documented and uh, written out for you in this fuzzy search bar. So we'll look at, we'll select the set velocity. And uh, here we just need two inputs. There's an X and a Y. So I'll just input a negative one for now and hit play. So if you look at the flow graph, you can see that there are pulses ticking over into the next node. All right, it shows you the activity and which nodes are active. You can see that the uh, obstacles are now being pushed right to left. And it also, it's moving a little bit slow. It'd be nice if we have a way where we can uh, adjust it in, in runtime. Uh, and you can, you can actually do that in the graph, but it'd be nicer to uh, also tweak it in Inspector so that we don't have to look at the graph when we actually are just tweaking the levels, uh, designing it and fine tuning our game. So let me just pause this first. And uh, you'll notice that when we created our flow machine, we also added a variable component. Now this comes for free. It comes together with the flow machine. Um, and this defines all the variables that's attached to this game object here. So at any point of time, you can actually define a new variable that you want over here. So for this, it's basically just the speed. So let's define it. Let's call this obstacle. Let's call this variable speed and give it a type. This is obviously it's a vector two, but it's okay. We can always just, yeah, you can just stick to a vector t three, that's fine. And then just convert this to, yeah, let's just add a value of negative one for x. And then drag this over into the flow graph. You can see that it'll automatically create for you a git variable node. And that refers to your speed variable. So from here, you can just drag this out and plug it into the feed, play. And now we have basically something exposed in the inspector that can drag to move. Okay, cool. So it looks like negative five or negative six is kind of a good number. So I'm gonna set it as that. And that's it for our obstacle. But right now, if I play it, our obstacle only goes right to left, but it never comes back. So we'll have to code the logic for that. By code, I mean create the node flow for that. 
Okay, so this is still going to be an obstacle. And conveniently in this demo project in the hierarchy, if I look here, there's a little object called left barrier. And this left barrier, if I look at the scene view, is placed right outside the game, game view. It's got a collider, and it's got a tag called barrier L with a capital L. So it's important, we need to copy that name exactly. Um, basically, that's the tag that we need to compare for us to reset the position of our um, of our uh, obstacle. Yeah. So I'm going to go back to my obstacle. And uh, now I'm just going to yeah, look for, detect for another event. So we have an update event here. But for us to trigger an on-trigger event, we'll need to create a on-trigger enter. So because this is a 2D project, I'm going to use on trigger into 2D. And then I'm going to do a compare tag. And click, tag unit, compare tag, game object compare tag, plug the flow into that, and then compare to check if it's barrier L. If it is barrier L, you'll see that uh, it has an output here that's uh, color coded in purple. Uh, so this purple represents Boolean in Bolt, right? So this could be a true or a false. We don't know. So we have to pass it to another node to kind of figure that out. So that node is going to be our branch. So I'll pass it to a branch node, right? Move the control flow over. So this is the logical flow going to our branch. And uh, whether it's true or false, we'll handle it from this control flow. Right, so if it's false, uh, we, we really don't care. Like we don't want anything to happen. We only care if like something true happens. Like if it hits the barrier L. So if I'm here, if it's true, we'll just do a set position, transform set position, and set it to its original position, which is ten. Okay, so I'll set it to ten, and play. So you can pay attention to the, the graph flow here. It's always colliding with something, but when it's colliding with a the barrier L, it will start to reset. Hmm. Okay. Let's see here. It's collider, obstacle, the barrier, barrier L. Just make sure I have that typed correctly. Uh, one trigger to D, compare type itself. Ah. Yeah, well, this is an obstacle, that's correct. Sweet. Oh, what happened there? Okay, you can see it's frequently colliding. And then when it collides with the barrier, it should pass it through and then set position to the right. Ah, okay, I missed this. I missed one input. Here, on trigger, uh, we get a reference to a collider. So when you do a compare tag, you of course have to compare with that object, right? So you need to plug this into that before that works. Okay, on the screen, it touches and it loops. Nice. Okay, so that's looping uh, and it, yeah, it, it loops on the x axis. Uh, but what we want to do is also, if you want to introduce some randomization, it's really easy to do that. Um, you can see that we we can create it sort of in line in the set position node, but uh, we can also feed it kind of a new uh, vector three that we want to create on the fly here. Okay, so let's say if I drag this out, I can define a new a brand new vector three, and for the x axis we know this is going to be ten. For the y. This is the part we want to randomize. So we'll actually add a brand new node here to randomize things. Just type in random and uh, use a random min max. And we'll give it a zero to let's say negative two or negative three. Yeah. Save this and give it a play. Okay, so I'll put my mouse cursor on top of where it was originally. You can see that it will start to randomize its position. There we go. So now I'll make the game a little bit more interesting. So while we're working on this, um, you can see that the nodes 
really start to add up and things can get quite uh, crazy. Uh, you don't want to keep this uh, in, in such a mess, right? So you, you don't want to come in here and have to kind of figure out the notes yourself to, to read through all the logical flows for this and this. So we better start kind of uh, labeling them or at least grouping them. So what you can do with uh, both is you can hold right uh, control on your keyboard and left click to draw a rectangle. And this will group whatever nodes that are within this rectangle. So I can call this uh, maybe a respawn. Right, so that's the respawn logic. And here is the, let's tag it, movement logic. Now, what I love about this is you can also color code this. If you look at these, uh, if you select these groups and look at them in the graph inspector, you can also color code them to a different color. Let's say response are always red and uh, movement logics are always blue. That could be something that you define in your team internally. And it just makes everything you know, nicer to look at and more organized. So that's great. So that's, uh, that's it for the obstacle. Now we can move on to uh, create setting up uh, our main character, Penny Pixel herself. So same thing, we're going to repeat the same thing. Go to Inspector, uh, add a component, a Flow Machine. And uh, because there's only going to ever be one Penny Pixel, I can choose to just choose uh, embed, an embedded flow. And I'll start editing here. So first thing you want to do for this character is, of course, make her jump. So. Uh, for every frame, we need to detect whether our player has actually pressed the button, right? So we need to get an input. So let's look for it. So I'll drag this out, look for a node. We'll say get input down. Oops. Okay, let's try that again. Right click, get input down. Get input, oh, sorry. Get key down. Oh, this confuses me. Get key down here. Pass the flow over. And the key, you can you can look for it. It's basically all the keyboards, uh, keyboard keys mapped into this enum, right? This drop down list. So we can look for uh, space. That's a common key that people use to jump. So we use space. And uh, next, this you can see refer to the output. Always refer to the output if you're not sure what comes next, because this will tell you what needs to be done to process this logic. So here you have purple, that means it's a Boolean, which means we need to check whether it's true or false. So we'll pass it to another branch. All right, and we pass the Boolean over. And in this branch, we only care if it is true. So if it's true, we will do a jump. So we can do the same thing we did for the obstacle. We just set velocity. So rigid body velocity and uh, define as uh, eight on y axis. So again, if you want to define this in the uh, object variables, you can do that too. I could set this as maybe uh, jump height, for example. I expose this in expector so that we can edit it uh, nicely and easily in the future. So this would be value of eight. Drag it over and then just plug it in. Nice. So this is any pixels jump logic. Let's play that. Okay, cool. So I'm able to jump now across obstacles. Perfect. But you'll notice that her animations didn't change at all. So in this character, the artist has prepared an animator for her and is an animation uh, there's an animator controller with a bunch of states um, already set up for us. So there's a jump hole where she's just uh, holding a pose when she's jumping. And then there's a hurt pose. And all these are governed by these two parameters, which is a Boolean and a trigger. So for us to trigger a, a change in state from our player running into our player jump, right? we need to uh, change to enable these conditions. So we have jumping requires, we need jumping to be true for us to actually transition into jump. So uh, we can control that entirely inside bolt too. So switch over here. I already know the, the variables that's hurt and jumping. 
So we'll go ahead and edit them here. So I'll create another uh, update node. Okay. And in this update node, I'm going to look for or check whether or not the player is holding down the space bar key. So check for get key. Right. Without the down because uh, we want to check whether they're holding it down. So I'll switch it over to spacebar. And if the play if the player is holding it down, right, uh, you need to know whether it's true or false. Actually, we don't because um, you can just directly feed this into the the animator set pool. So right click and add unit here and look for animator set pool. Right. That looks like the correct one. The first one is animator set pool. I'll select that. Pass the control flow over. Uh, it's referring to itself, it's, which is correct. The animator's attached to herself, and then this is jumping. And whether or not it's true or false is determined by whether or not the player has pressed the spacebar key. So I'll just feed that in. And it works. Just in three nodes, you're able to do, you're able to you know, run the animation there. Okay, the last thing that we need to do for this character is to make her uh, get hurt when she hits an obstacle. So let's just really quickly clean this up. Call this uh, animation, jump animation. Okay, and uh, next I'm going to do her interaction. So again, like the obstacle, she's going to need to uh, trigger, collide with something and trigger uh, a set of flows. So this is an on trigger enter 2D. All right, and uh, check whether she has enter, uh, collided with something. Yeah, if she's collided with something, we need to compare the tag on that collider to see whether it matches the, the hazard or obstacle tag. So here we do a compare tag again. And yeah, you can pretty much guess we're doing the exact same thing as we did before, right? We have to create a compare tag and then create another branch. Um, and uh, things like this happen. And in programming, usually you're, you'll be advised to not repeat yourself, right? Don't repeat yourself, D-R-Y, dry. Um, so that, that transfers nicely here because in both, you can actually create your own custom nodes or a set of nodes. You can actually group a bunch of nodes together to form what is called a super unit that you can reuse again and again. So I'm going to go ahead and create a super unit here. Uh, it's a relatively simple one. So I'm not going to build this over here. I'm just going to jump back into my obstacle because we've already built this logic over here, right? There's a compare tag and a branch tag. So I'm going to copy both of these or cut them and I'm going to right click and create a brand new thing called a super unit. Okay and I'm uh, going to double click the super unit and you can see in our flow graph now we have uh, two, two objects side by side or the two nodes side by side. There's an obstacle and then there's a super unit node. Right. The, so the super unit is a child of the obstacle node. If we want to go back to obstacle we can always click obstacle but to go back to the super unit, we can double click it. Now in here, this is where we can paste our logic that we created earlier. And uh, we'll be able to define some uh, the, the proper inputs and outputs from here on. Okay, so it's not that great to just leave it as you know, a simple super unit. Um, if we're gonna create a custom node, we might as well make it special. We need to, we, when we make something special, we want to name it. So we'll go into the graph inspector here. And while you're in the super unit, you can see that there is a title that's left empty. If it's empty, it's just called super unit. So from here, you can just call it, because uh, we're checking whether or not it's colliding with something. You can say uh, collided with, has collided with, or let's keep it short, collided with. Okay, and you can see now the super unit has changed to its name to collided with. If I go to obstacle, you can see it's Called super unit collided with. Okay, so now we need to define the control flow for input and output. So I'll go to my input. I'll just add a new input control flow. 
I'll just simply name it in, which is good enough because we just need to like pass this flow elsewhere. So to go to the next node. And then the output node, we'll need one for this too. We'll call this out. And I'll create an out, output flow. And I'll drag true to out. So you can create one for false as well, but in this case for our collided with special node, we only care about it being true. So I'm just gonna leave it as just one output flow, right? So this is um, why you would you know, have multiple output flows is because of branches like this. So next is for this logic to work, for it to come out as true, we also need to pass in the object that we are comparing with and the tag that we wanna compare with. Right, so go back to our input here. We'll define more value inputs. So this is gonna be the game object that you want to reference. Make sure we label the type or set the type. This is a game object. And then another one will be the string that defines the tag. We'll call this tag and call this, uh, make this a type string. And uh, for strings, it's usually quite helpful to have a default value so that you can type this in uh, rather than having to create another node to feed it in later. So this will appear right here in our input node. We can just drag this over. And that completes our super unit. Okay, so I'll exit here. Now you can see our super unit has a uh, you know, bunch of inputs and outputs that we've defined. And remember the, uh, the default, so that basically exposes this small little text box here, which you can easily just type rather than creating another node to feed it in here, which we just might make it a bit messy. Okay, so let's feed this in. So I've condensed two nodes into one, which doesn't seem like much because our project is relatively simple. Uh, but if you're, once you've you know, developed your project and it gets a little bit bigger, you'll probably, yeah, this, this will come in really, really helpful. Okay, so now that we have this, you have the collided with super unit. You can either copy this or just invoke it from your fuzzy search later on when you go to Penny Pixel. So I'm just gonna go over back to our character, Penny. And I'm on trigger here. You can just right click, add unit, and look for our newly created super unit collided with. Collided. Ah, oh no, I missed a step. So I'm gonna go back to obstacle. When creating our super unit, uh, so this is the difference, the, this is a good place to illustrate the difference between embed and macro. So because I created an embed, the super unit only exists inside the obstacle flow, uh, the obstacle machine. Um, so I sh will need to actually convert this to a macro if I want to use it project-wide. Okay, so I'm gonna hit convert and then choose a place to save this in IGDC demo. And save this as uh, collided with Okay, so you can see that it creates an asset. And now you can go to Penny Pixel, right click, add unit, and look for collided with. There we go. So your own custom node created for anyone and everyone to use inside your project. So we can pass this over here. And uh, Penny is looking for the obstacle to collide with, so type in obstacle. And if she does hit the obstacle, which is true, then uh, we can do something to it. So similar to earlier, when we set our animation, we'll be setting a trigger in this case, right? If you look at the animator, this one hurt is a trigger, whereas jumping is a Boolean, right? You can inspect them from the transitions here. So here, the, uh, the trigger here is called hurt, so I'll type hurt in there. And now uh, that plays, when she gets hit, you see that she plays the hurt animation. And then what we also want to do is actually push her back to give her a knockback, just to you know, get the feeling that of being hurt. So we'll do the same thing as what we did before. We just do a set velocity. All right, and then I'll push her uh, backwards eight units and upwards eight units. Let's see how that goes. Wow. Okay, but uh, yeah, we probably don't want to torture her that much to keep on pushing her off screen. 
I think once is enough. So we'll have to keep a variable to to say that you know penny is you know, penny is alive or penny is dead. Um, so on our object our character penny, uh, we can create an, a variable on her, like what we did with the jump height. So you can either do it in here in the variable inspector or in the inspector window itself uh, when you're selecting, of course, penny pixel. So here, uh, let's just define a new variable to say to check that she is alive. So I'll type in here is alive, press enter. And then this is going to be a simple Boolean. That means it's a yes or no. And of course, uh, so I'm going to check this as on. Okay. So here at the end of this this trail of uh, nodes, right? When she when she collides with something, uh, she triggers her animation. And she gets pushed back. At the end of it, of course, we want to set her as, uh, you know, alive or dead. So if you drag this uh, variable in into your th into the flow graph, you see that you get a get variable. So if you want to do a set variable, you can either do a right-click add unit and set variable, which can take a while. Uh, a better alternative is actually to use your keyboard. You can hold the Alt key on your keyboard and just drag the uh, variable from the inspector in. And you can see that instead of get variable, you're getting set variable. So it's really convenient. And I feel that like this is a really nice addition. It's a really cool uh, quality of life addition to, to this otherwise uh, amazing tool. So we'll go into this graph. Uh, we'll say uh, set is alive as give it a bool little pass in the boolean and say false. Hi right. Sean. So yeah, basically just say hi Sean can you hear me? State. So I'll hit play. She gets hit and you can see her value is now false. But she's still being hit. So what I can do is do a check a check in the beginning uh, to check whether or not she's alive or dead. Okay, so that just requires a simple branch. And a branch. Okay, that's the logical flow here. And then, uh, yeah, we do get. You need to get. The state of whether or not she is alive again. Okay, she gets hit and she never interacts with the other obstacle ever again. So perfect. So this is the this entire flow here. This is the collision. Uh, so Penny's collision. Hey Sean, uh, ten minutes more. We have a lot of Q and A's as well. Uh, you can look at the q a points sorry the this questions oh okay very right. should we wait for bolt two to avoid unlearning bolt one uh no actually you you don't have to because um most of the knowledge would actually transfer uh over our behavior tree is covered in bolt uh, bolt two Behavior trees. I'll have to check with you on that. Uh, I'll just check back with you on that. Uh, get in touch maybe after. I'll, I'll get more information about that for you. Which one do you think is best code language for beginners? Huh. Okay. That's that's a hmm. Uh, for for use within Unity, or for general purpose. I'd say if it's in Unity, well, you're kind of locked with. Uh, C sharp, um, which is actually pretty easy to pick up, actually, um, especially within Unity. It's the environment within Unity just gives you a lot of feedback for you to work with, and the community is just uh, widespread enough that uh, you can get help for any basic problems that uh, that you face. How does Bolt stack to dots visual scripting as Unity is moving towards moving more towards dots and ECS? So dots and ECS is going always going to be an optional tool. It's not meant to replace everything that you know and love about uh, object-oriented programming in C-sharp. Uh, 
it can act as a supplement uh, or completely uh, replace your replace your core workflow. But it's never meant to completely remove uh, your your what what we know and we do now. So as for the difference between like both and dots visual scripting, obviously uh, dots will be a lot more performant, uh, but both will probably be both is currently um, the only solution that we have now for visual scripting in, well, at least a free tool for visual scripting in within Unity. Where can I access access this example project? Um, this example project uh, will, will link you to a bunch of resources that you can get. Um, not only just this proje project, but uh, there is a tree. There should be a 3D project that you can uh, play around with. There's, there's a 3D platformer that you can uh, tweak around and play with after this. I think that answers the questions that we have. Do we still have time? Yeah, you'll have another uh, five minutes. So. Okay, another five minutes. Yeah. Ah, okay. So five minutes. Uh, I'm okay, okay. I'm gonna skip to one of the more important ones. <clears throat> So I jump into a game manager here. Um, one of the things that you will commonly do inside uh, when, you're, when you're making a game is uh, timers, right? You need, you need to count the value up, and it, when, you, when it hits a certain value, um, you want to increment another number, right? The timers is something that you have to rebuild again and again inside uh, when you're programming. But in uh, Bolt, we actually have a really cool node that actually simplifies all of this. Um, and that is, in, uh, that is, let me just create a game manager here. I don't want to create a script. I'll create a machine, flow machine, that is a game manager. So this is just going to be embedded. Um, so if you want to increase this number, right, there's a cool node called the cooldown node. And this allows you to increment uh, a value over there. If I just go ahead and create a score variable, set this as an integer. Um, basically, this lets you count out a timer. And when the timer is reached, you can execute a flow of logic. And uh, the timer duration can be set just right here. It's one, two, whatever you want. Uh, when it hits that, that mark, you can always say to set variable or just come here and alternate drag, set variable, pull it over. And of course, we want to increment from our previous variable. So we drag it in again, get our previous variable, add, do an add, a generic math add, add with an integer, a literal integer of one. So for every second, we're adding one, unit, one point to this Score, yeah. Okay, so if I play this right now, you can see from here in our variable, see the score is incrementing just by using this cooldown time. So it simplifies uh, you know, counting up um, in, in Unity or creating a game. Because so if you were to normally do it in, uh, uh, in code, you'd have to create there are a bunch of variables to support it, but in this case, you only need one. Okay, and uh, one last thing, if we still have time, uh, because I did promise you I would show you the difference between a state machine and a flow machine. Um, this is useful in setting up, setting it up in the setting up a game manager because typically a game you would have multiple states. You have a the moment where you are in gameplay and another state where you are just viewing a menu, maybe it's a game over. So in this case, we have two states for Penny. We could have a, uh, let me just keep that there first, keep this as in there. And uh, if we create a state machine, you can see that you have a starting state, uh, which you can, of course, rename as, let's say, game. And this can transition into, if I right click on it, make a transition. This can transition into a new state that you can call uh, what's here? This state that you can call game 
over. Yeah. So this transition, this state transitions can also be has also this middle node here, which is the condition for you to transition the trigger the transition the state. So it's similar to your animation, your animator, where you have these arrows um, and a condition to before you can execute the transition. Uh, for this, the, the most convenient way is actually to have an event system where Penny could invoke an event and then we can just uh, go ahead and react to it. So at the end of uh, the Penny collision uh, graph here, you can do a custom event. Let's do for event. Do a trigger, trigger event. You can give this event a name, say on hurts. Okay, so that's it. We can all already go over to game manager and uh, select the machine, edit this graph, go in here. And from here, we can create a reference to Penny first. Penny is a game object. We'll reference her by dragging her in there. Put this over and say create a new event called custom event. So we're referencing uh, the event on Penny. And if the event uh, on Hurt happens, we'll trigger this transition. So to enable this transition to uh, move from game to game over. So by playing this now, you can see that uh, game is highlighted as blue, but once Penny gets hit, the event is invoked, and you can see our pulse tick down, and now we're in game over. So now game over will be active, and we can start to build another logical flow from here. That's it. So do we have time to like, complete the project? Or do you guys have any questions? Hi, Sean, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, yes, you have five more minutes. Oh, I do have five more minutes. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> right. Let's wrap this up. So, so of course, the flow flow graph here. Uh, while I've already built this, I can always still cut and copy and paste it uh, back into the state graph. Basically, uh, you can hold this. Okay, now let's push this down so we get a clear view. A uh, state machine here basically holds multiple flow machines within it. Right? As you can see, if I go to edit state machines, these are all flow graphs or flow machines. So, in actuality, we don't need this over here because this will run uh, on its own perpetually. So, what I want to do is actually just cut this all out, go into my state machine instead, and paste it into game. Let's just remove all of this and paste it. Okay, so that means we don't need this flow machine anymore. We can remove that, and it's all just happening on our state machine. And just to complete this, uh, we need to complete the logic on game over. When we enter the game over state, on entering that state, we can do things like uh, changing the background color, for example, or changing the text to say game over. So I can just drag this up. Let's add a reference to all those objects that I just mentioned. In background, Name this, uh, this is the background. If you look here, just to inspect and give you some context, the background is a sprite renderer. So I'll just type that name exactly. So right here, just type in sprite renderer. Okay, and then we'll reference that directly, drag and drop, put it in here. And what I'm going to do to it is just set color. And this is a sprite renderer set color. So let's look at that sprite renderer. Okay, set color. Let me drag this over here and change the color to red. And then similarly for the, the text here, this text is defined by this thing, this component. It's called a text mesh pro. So the naming is important. You need to pay attention to what it's named. Uh, that'll really help you in finding like the nodes that you want to look for. So over here, we just change, we'll follow on along with this flow, we'll just look for a text mesh pro. 
Okay, there's a UGUI text mesh pro. Let's see what we can do with this. Can we set the text? It should be sorted alphabetically, so that will help us so set text. There we go. Okay, so we just need to set text, um, say game over. And of course, this can't be referencing itself because the uh, game manager doesn't have a text mesh pro, so it needs to refer to something else there. So we create another variable, say the say label, call this text mesh pro, you agree, drag that over, and pass this as a reference. Okay, I'm playing, jump, 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 and it's game over. So we probably need to add a check for uh, not allowing the player to jump, but yeah, you get the idea. So I uh, printing. You know, to from your score to the text up here is the same thing, uh, and you don't have to worry about stopping that because you already built the state machine to handle it, right? Because uh, you can do the incrementing the number incrementing here to increment the number there. Uh, and you don't have to care about stopping it because your graph already handles the flow, logical flow, to pass it over to game over. And I'll just take over by overriding it with the text game over. Okay, so before we end this, I just want to leave you guys with some helpful resources for you to look more into uh, your journey into Bolt. Uh, these are resources you can just screenshot them or maybe look over them through, look over them during the recording. Uh, there's some samples for you to download and play around with, and there are some additional templates for you to uh, also explore and build on top of. So that's my presentation. Uh, I'm Sean from Unity 3D, and uh, this, if you are available on Facebook or you dwell on YouTube, we have YouTube channels for the uh, AMZ in Southeast Asia region, basically it's the SAPAC region, uh, where we will sometimes uh, upload uh, videos of our own um, and uh, we have a small community in Discord as well that you can join. Uh, so that's been my presentation. Uh, thank you so much, and uh, hope you have a good time exploring Bolt. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sean.